pleased to have our next talk from Pauline and Raphael, as we mentioned, they were uh, and still are forever Open DP fellows. Uh, so handing it off to Raphael, who's joining us actually remote from Germany at the moment. Thank you very much. It's it's really a good pleasure, I know, to be to to not be here today actually, but to to, to have the opportunity to present uh, all the projects that we are actually conducting within the federal statistical office and more generally within uh, the Swiss federal administration on differential privacy. So, as you would mention, uh, I apologize for not being here in person today. Uh, actually, I had a, another appointment in Germany, but my colleague Pauline he is, is present here today and she, she's going to do the majority of the talk. So um, let me just give you uh, a, a general idea of actually where we, we oops, where we, oops, that should be working yes of where we we both come from so uh, we are both member of uh, the so-called data science competence center who has been created about two years ago under the the mandate of our uh, federal council so it's the highest political authority in switzerland and this center has actually two main uh, missions the first one is to conduct innovation projects uh, in data science using uh, using data science in the federal administrations. So in collaboration with all potential federal offices. So for instance, we have collaboration with office, uh, the Federal Office of Transport, the Federal Office of Public Health and so on. And the second mission is actually to develop the, the practice of data science for public good within our administrations. And so to do so, we have devised a, a code of conduct, which you can see here. And it's divided into uh, three main pillars. The first one is about ethics. Uh, so it's all about non-discrimination, objectivity, and representativeness. So it's more the classical mission of the National Statistical Office, and it's aligned with the, the classical code of conduct of, um, of, of, uh, uh, of public statistics. The second, the second pillar of this code of conduct is about transparency. And this is important for us when we develop a new machine learning or artificial intelligence model. We always try to ensure that those models are explainable, that they rely on ideally open source implementation, and more importantly, that everything that we do is reproducible. Uh, it's good and in, in reproducible not only uh, within a few weeks, but ideally in two, five, even 10 years in the future. And finally, the third pillar of, of this code of conduct is about privacy. And so this is the most important for us today. So first of all, we need to ensure that we keep the governments of our data. Uh, second, that everything that we have available is securely um, stored and managed. So this is usually the responsibility of, of our IT services. And finally, and the, why we are here today, it's all about, it's about data confidentiality and ensuring that we are not uh, making uh, in, uh, inducing any risk for our citizens when we are disclosing uh, statistics data or, or giving access to sensitive data. And so this code of conduct has been developed with the hope that if we follow all these guidelines, we are re we remain under the rule of law and that we are maintaining, if not building public trust uh, if, uh, with respect to the administration. So now let's dig in and I will give you a, a few, uh, an overview of the projects where we have been uh, you're trying to consider to use differential privacy to release some, some statistics. So the first one is about poverty index estimation in Switzerland. So how does it work today? We have a yearly survey, uh, which is actually standardized at the European level. And this survey in Switzerland is a phone questionnaire uh, uh, for about uh, 17,000 people. So it's uh, roughly three, 4,000 households. So it's a, re a relatively small survey but it's already quite expensive. Um, this survey has been actually, even if it's a small sample size, it has been very well designed by our methodological team and it's uh, representative, uh, representative of the Swiss population. And it's also robust for what we call large regions. So it's the colored region, the large region that you see here on the right uh, on the screen. Now, we recently received uh, a request from our federal council to produce this, the, same, the same statistics, but at a, a finer uh, geographical resolution. It's the, the, the cantonal level. So it's all those much smaller regions that you now see on the right. The difficulty is, is that this is already expensive. So we are trying to, to see what kind of solution were available to, to produce these statistics without having to drastically increase the sample size, which would induce a much higher cost. 
So this is why we explored the possibility to perform data imputation. So it's basically trying to use uh, an auxiliary source of information that is in this particular case available at the population level. So for each individual in Switzerland. So here we are talking of the register data. So it's for instance, location of residence, family status and so on. So it's more or less the equivalent of, of, of what would the, the census bureau would provide in the US. And so thanks to this auxiliary source information, we can start performing data imputation. So how does it work? Basically, we're gonna estimate the poverty status of each individual in Switzerland for who for who have not been part of, of the survey itself. So whenever we try to estimate a fraction of, of a poor individual living in Switzerland for each independent region, then we use the following formula here. And we, we have two possibilities, either the data uh, either the individual is part of the survey, so we have the true poverty status, or uh, it's an estimation based on some function f here in red, which depends of this auxiliary source of data at the population level. Unfortunately, this function f is unknown in practice, that would be too easy. But actually, we can use uh, machine learning to try to learn this function from the data. So this has been done by my colleague. Uh, they have been selected a sufficiently performing model and properly quantifying the uncertainty such that we can provide a reasonable estimate of, of the, the poverty um, status of each individual in Switzerland. So the question is now that we have uh, this kind of, of, uh, of statistics potentially available at an arbitrary high resolution in Switzerland, there's an obvious uh, privacy risk. And this is why we were wondering if differential privacy could help. And actually, differential could help. We start collaborating <laughs> with the OpenDP project to see how we could implement differential privacy when releasing the statistics. But we also realized that actually differential privacy, while promising to protect individual contribution of uh, the contribution of each individual, cannot also preclude any potential discrimination or harm stemming from geographical information. So we are actually exploring possibilities uh, through the collaboration with the OpenDP project to see how we could accommodate differential privacy to also provide guarantees in this particular case. The second project I wanted to mention is about the income statistics, which is also a very important statistic provided by the National Statistical Office, which is communicated every year through a web application called Salarium. So if you go on the web, you can find this web page, and then you can interactively fill some, some criteria. So for instance, where you live, what is your formation, what age, and so on. And if you select all the different multiple categories, then you would get statistics for your of salary statistics that is tailored to your uh, set of criteria. So as you can see, you will get a table here with to, to just to give you if you're a man or a woman, how much you would make um, with under this criteria. Now, in some cases, instead of having those nice statistics, you just have this, you just receive up, this kind of messages. Sorry should go for the next one, yes. So I apologize, this is in French, but uh, uh, unfortunately English is not an official language in Switzerland. So if you have, if you speak German, Italian or French, you can make it, make a try for yourself. And basically if I can, I can just tell you that this message is just saying, okay, we cannot provide the statistics for privacy reason. And the main privacy reason here is that the, the group of population from whom you're trying to uh, to get statistics is too small. And so this is why we were wondering, is it possible to use differential privacy to still communicate the statistics in this particular case while maintaining privacy? So we have been collaborating with um, with the OpenDP project, mostly to implement, uh, to implement uh, differential privacy in this particular case. And especially um, it's a particularly challenging problem because uh, uh, income statistics, uh, income data in general is highly skewed with a, 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 right, a, a heavy, a potentially very heavy right tail. That's why we end up with potentially very large sensitivity if we just do a naive implementation of differential privacy. So this is where the collaboration has been particularly valuable. And uh, finally, about those two projects, and we, we one important point is that those were innovation projects, and right now we are wondering or trying to see if we could move all these things to production, and actually applying differential privacy in production is challenging. We're not the first one to 
make this observation. Actually, the, the US Census Bureau has made the same, uh, the same observation. And for that, we need to have secure and robust end-to-end -end data pipeline. So this is why during the course of the summer, um, thanks to, to, to Michael, Anna, and Pauline, um, there have been an integration uh, of the, within the OpenDP uh, library of of the uh, of the polar the polar package uh, the the polar library so polars is actually the the rust equivalent of the python package uh, pandas or the data the data dot table or library and so thanks to polars we can have data frame representation and to be able to have full end to end data pipeline within opendp that that are secure all the way from data ingestion up to um, statistical release using uh, of uh, the release of, of statistics using differential privacy. And thanks to this great work, actually, I would like to mention a, a, a last project, and this is the one that Pauline is going to present in detail, is uh, this project is about uh, trying to give access for uh, to researchers uh, to, to, to sensitive data in order to perform data analysis. So really, we're trying to enable them a uh, new analysis using differential privacy while maintaining and or controlling the disclosure risk through this platform. So I just wanted to mention that this, this uh, new project, it's still a proof of concept within our office. Uh, it was presented to the directors of the federal office earlier this month. And first, they all understood very well what we what was about and how differential privacy works. And second, it was very well received. So we hope that we'll manage to have this kind of platform in production in the in the future. So Pauline, uh, I leave you I leave you the floor to 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 present in detail this um, this very nice project. Uh, yes, thank you, Ben. Uh, can you hear me? All right. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to present this project, which is a platform to enable to share uh, confidential uh, analysis and confidential data through a client server approach. So the idea came to Rafael actually after last year's hackathon, where we helped uh, prepare the UN Pet Lab hackathon. And in this hackathon, Oblivious created a um, client server platform where uh, participants of a hackathon made differentially private queries to a server which had sensitive data to try to learn um, about sensitive columns and then do predictions in a real life competition. Um, and so then Oblivious shared their code with us and developed the explanation. It was a great starting point for, for our project. Um, there are two, there are many good reasons to do this project. Two main ones would be the efficiency to simplify uh, the sharing of that with um, researchers and also to have less cost, less uh, time wasted to, to do all the administrative. Thing to do, and also for the reputation of the Swiss administration, it's very good because we are able to share things that are safely. Um, so, that's an overview of the architecture, um, very simplified on uh, the right, your right, no, your left. Uh, you have the researchers, um, they want to have access to data, but uh, it's sensitive data, so we don't, we cannot give it to them on our server. Uh, and to the researcher, we give them a, a client library that they will be able to use to interact with the server. On the server, we have all the logic, differentially private logic, such that uh, when a query is issued to an API from the researcher, we can process this query, see if the user exists, has access to the data set, has enough budget, if the query um, is acceptable or not, if it's a measurement, for instance, in the basic and not just information. Um, do all this logic and return a different different of private uh, response. Um, so for the server side, so this side here, uh, everything is really automated. The idea is if you share this with different organization or NSO uh, to deploy it's an automated process. So we use with standard tools such as Docker or Kubernetes, and we have a hand chart to deploy. So the technical maybe for some people, but it, it's it's supposed to be easy to deploy and very automated. Um, okay. And also we have admin database which manages the, uh, the users, uh, their budget, uh, where the data sets are stored. We want to enable different data sets to be in different databases, uh, the storage of metadata, and also being archives of all the queries that are made to, to know what people are looking at. So that's going to 
good side of the presentation, I will do a demo. So um, in this setting, we are Dr. Antarctica, and we want to do some research on the penguins, flipper lengths, and bill lengths. Um, and it's very sensitive data, so we cannot have it seen directly, but we, we have access to servers to do with different private queries. Uh, so we, for people less uh, used with the machine learning, usually we have iris data set, and we use features such as uh, beta lengths and uh, sepal lengths to do um, to learn about some data. Here we take the examples of, of penguins, but it's the same as just features that we could use. Uh, that there will be a second, a bit more serious example, which will be on the income data set that Rock presented, just to showcase the work we did with products and the new capabilities it offers. Um, so, like demo. Um, so, we're on the client side, so we are both on Antarctica, and we have never seen the penguin data set. So we want to, so first we install the library that is provided by the open source, so it would just be a open source. And uh, with this library, we initialize a client that will speak directly with the server. So here it's, it's locally, so it's uh, just a simple HTTP, but it could be any URL depending on where you deploy the server. Uh, she has to give her name and the data set she wants to, to query. Um, so she has never seen the data and she wants to get an idea. A first good idea would be to look at the metadata on the data set. So we offer this possibility with just this function get data set metadata. And we kept the metadata in the format that was done by SmartNode SQL that Sally mentioned this morning because we don't want to read from the way. So uh, with this metadata, she's able to know that there are seven columns in the data set, the type of data in each column, and even the bounds in the data set. That's great. Uh, she has the first idea of what's going on in the data set. But now it's a data frame, and here it's a, a dictionary representation. So we, we give another function to give her a better idea of what's in the data set and get the new data set. So what this function does is on the fly, based on the metadata that is stored, the, the public metadata, it will create a dummy data frame that actually she will be able to look at. So no budget is spent, it just will be based on metadata to create a dummy data set. So she has not, uh, there is no privacy issue, she did not learn anything more than what's in the metadata, but already she has a good idea of the representation and how, how she could do her analysis. So now we can think she can, she could start to to query on the real data set, but she's not very confident yet because she has not uh, really interacted with it, and so it would be yeah she does not want to waste budget on wrong queries, so we give the option to query on the dummy data set. So this will go through the exact same process as if it were on the real data set, but just on the dummy data set, and it won't spend any any budget. So that's what she does. Um, and this is the exact same query as what she would do um, on the real data set, client smart node query. Uh, just she sets the flag dummy equal true, and so she does not spend anything not now. Uh, and so it executes in the server. And here she has the results. So these results are fakes based on random generation of metadata, but she still has the pipeline works. And so now she, she, she believes in the system, she's confident it will work. And um, she should really proceed. Uh, there's just a few more things she wants to check before uh, doing the real query. She wants to check what is her the, the budget was, that was allocated for her in the server. So she has 10 epsilon and zero delta. Um, the total budget is spent to now, so nothing it was a random metadata based on metadata. And the read, read, remaining budget, so that she spent nothing is shown. Um, and the last step before really doing the query, that would be to estimate the real cost of the query. So in uh, OpenDB, you can do the state or the Atlas, and so we don't know about the epsilon and delta yet, or in Smart as SQL, when we give epsilon and delta to the query, it's not really the one that is used. So we give these options to be able to know what is the real epsilon and delta that will be used if you execute uh, a query. Uh, that's what she does here. So for an experiment of 0.5 uh, delta of 10.4, 4, 
um, and which would reduce feedback to more obstruction. I forgot to mention uh, the queries that she's trying to do right now is to get the number of rows in the data set, the number of penguins, and uh, the average buildings uh, of the penguins. Penguins. So again, now she knows how much it costs, she knows it works in the server, she's ready to do it on the real uh, private data. Um, and so she does it with just the exact same command as before on the dummy, just setting as a dummy equal false, or not just not setting the dummy, and it will execute on the real private data set. And she can see the results. So there are 347 penguins in the data set, and the um, average building is 44. So this is the differential in private results um, on the penguin utility data. Uh, she can now check her remaining budget, so it's what she had at the beginning minus what she just spent, and um, the total spend budget, so the total of the period. Um, so it's open to community meetings, so I'm going to show an example with open TP directly, and this one will be to have the variance of the bid length of penguins. Um, so in open TP, you always need to define the input space, for this, she can just check the metadata again, she will get the information she needs. So the columns inside the data frame, she, she just gets them back from the metadata, rewrite them, and extract the bounds of the planning uh, from the metadata of, of the data set. And then she writes her query to actually get the variance. So if you use with um, OpenDB, it's very standard, I read the data frame, Select the bit length column, um, its code values, then clamp as a real bounds, as a, the one she got from the metadata, uh, resize to the number of penguins she estimates, and compute the bias. Um, and when she does this, she wants to apply it on the query, but of course it fails because it's a transformation and not a measurement, so the server will reject it automatic automatically. And so, yeah, she has this information. Uh, it cannot be processed because it's not a mission. But it's fine, she can continue. Uh, she just had a measurement with that class after the transformation by applying to get the bias of the difference. And now she should be able to execute the program. So yeah, once the data set now, it works. Uh, she can estimate the trust, increase trust. So here we give um, Laplace scale. Now we have the estimation of the and data. And we are ready to execute it on the real data set. So we just call the same open DB query with the type that we define. So transformation and there's a measurement. And we have the variance of the bin length of penguins with this uh, open DB query. And just putting everything together, so the count. Uh, average and bias, we get, uh, we can do all the post processing that we want, and we can compute the confidence interval of the buildings of penguins. Um, so, sadly, it's not always penguins. <laughs> now, uh, that's the income data set uh, example. Um, so, there's a lot more code, and it, it will change uh, because uh, Polars is not done yet in OpenTP, and the API will be simpler in the future. It's just to show the capabilities and it's, as soon as it's done, we will be very excited to implement it into, into our server. So this one is the income data set that Rafael um, explained just before. It's a synthetic data set. We also, in OpenDB, we define the input space. So the input space um, is a lazy frame that we will read and receive a computation on. So define the bounds on the income. Define the lazy frame with a different uh, column on the data sets. And we add also the type of data in each column and the bounds on the relevant column. We can add uh, metadata about the data sets. So here, there's a lot of line that is very simple. It's just uh, the count per partition. So uh, there are 2 million rows around in the data sets. And if you look at regions, in the region one, there are 350,000 people. Region two, uh, almost 500,000 people. So it's a count per partition. And this will enable to do the group by operation that we are interested in uh, on the data set. 
So it's just adding metadata into the lazy frame. Um, and then what we want to see with the income data sets is a box plot distribution of the income per region. And if people are men or women, what is the salary distribution? So we need uh, the median and the quartiles. So therefore, we will um, do uh, an open DP pipeline that will uh, compute the, the, the quantiles that we want and the selected partition of the population. So, and with the algorithm that we use, we need to give a selection of candidates for the candidates' um, potential income quantiles uh, that we are going to compute. Uh, the partition will be on sex and region because we want to see per region plus sex what is the salary of people. So we define this um, open DP pipeline uh, that will read the CSV, and the most important part will do group by on this partition that we collected. So that will be the new thing that was really important for us is this possibility to do group by on the data frame and then compute a private quantile on the income data set. Um, so we computed for 0 0.25, 25%, 50%, and 75% of the major quantile and the um, synthetic income data is computing right now. Uh, and then we are, we are able to see the results, um, the results of the, the different income distribution per partition of the population. Uh, so the table is not so nice and understandable. So again, post-processing is fine. So we can just visualize, visualize the results. Um, nice plus. And so yeah, with OpenDB, we could just in a few lines uh, compute the income per partition of the population. But we're really excited to have this in OpenDB that we'll be able to use. Um, uh, last slide, so um, there are many next steps. We are just getting started. Um, we have smart noise and OpenDP, and we integrate OpenDP in the future versions of OpenDP. Uh, the next one we want to add is also DP um, Of course, we want to make this project open source. So it's already public and GitLab, <laughs> but um, we really keep in mind that we want people to add their different possible databases or data sets or type of data. So we make all the logic the agnostic of everything so that people will be able to add and contribute to the future. Um, and we also integrate uh, the server, server logic into a data lab platform so that it's click and go and anyone could theoretically use it. Okay. Thank you for your attention. Time for one question. Thanks. Uh, Simpson Garfin, I used to be at the US Census Bureau. Um, this is amazing. And I have an operational question, which is let's say you deploy this on real confidential data sets with real uh, researchers. Do you imagine that each researcher gets their own privacy loss budget, and you do not aggregate them, you just hope that things work out? Or do you imagine that there would be a global privacy budget, and then after that, we don't allow any more research? Perfect. Do you take the question? Or... <laughs> So we, we didn't solve that yet. Uh, for now, I think the idea, what we are leaning towards is to have budget for each researchers and make them sign a, an agreement that they will not try to, let's say, uh, collaborate between each other. But this is still unclear and, and we have plenty of, of work ahead of us, especially working with our legal department to see how they would agree to, to move this to production. But um, yeah, I think for now the idea would have to be to to be independent because it might not be very practical to have one budget per data set and then to stop the research when the budget is done. So we have we have to compromise somewhere. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rafael.